of things organisations are doing that they didn't ought to be doing, but many, many more faults of omission. So things organisations need to be doing to be viable for that. Okay. So still today, this is the um, <coughs> traditional dominant model that people use to think about organisations, hierarchy model, um, which um, Ben and I had a, where are you Ben? We had a discussion, didn't we, about um, the origins of this? Yes. Um, so we both agree it came from a, from a guy who um, was asked to sort out or work out who was responsible for the train crash in, the, uh, in um, the US in the middle of the 19th century. And he gave the job of working out what had happened to the guy who designed the switch gear. And he used the same iconography as he used for designing switching yeah. systems um, to understand the organisation. So, Terrific for the things it's, it's designed for, which is modelling power, responsibility, and ultimately blame, like whose fault was the train crash. Um, less precise on some other stuff, so what the organisation actually does and how it does it, and the process and structures it uses to do that. So, you know, you might think some of those are quite important, so I, I happen to. So the colourful bag knitting on the left hand side is BSM. And Stafford Beer, who developed the model originally, was after a science of organisation. So what he wanted was to understand the invariant rules that apply to any type of organisation. So a social organisation, work organisation, a biological organisation, anything. And there's an awful lot in here. Um, so it looks horribly complex, but we're going to go through it bit by bit. And it's really, really quite simple. Um, and we represent it as a graphical model, not a particularly pretty graphical model, it has to be said. But underneath that actually is um, the model's based on how the organisation manages complexity. So underneath the graphical model are a set of complexity equations. So there's a lot of stuff in here, structures, processes, how the organisation takes decisions and communicates and where information needs to flow and how you manage delivery and how you manage change. So a lot of stuff in there. So we're going to go through how that's built up as a model bit by bit. So it starts with, in this model, the circles are what we call primary activities. So these are the things that the organisation does that actually deliver some value into the external environment. And there are different ways to define that, but I'm going to take that one as a, as a sort of useful one for now and separating that out from the things it needs to do to keep itself in being. Yeah, so um, if, we were taught, if we were in MBS, in Manchester Business School, Alliance Manchester Business School as it is now, because that's who gave them all the money to knock down the building so we can't have a room. Um, I don't, it wasn't personally motivated, I'm sure. So, um, teaching, and, indeed, teaching and, um, and research would be primary. Managing the finances or indeed managing the building would not be. Yeah? So that's something that it does to keep itself in being. So that distinction is a fundamental one and actually goes to questions of identity. So what business are we in and why are we in there? So, unfolding that complexity of the organisation so how it actually delivers what it delivers. We can do that from the top down. We can say, if we take our overall primary purpose, what are the things that we need to do to deliver that? Or we can do it from the bottom up. So we're doing some work at the moment um, <coughs> with a bunch of organisations, so seven organisations potentially coming together to act as one. So you can look at this as a sort of decomposition, or you can look at this as a building up to create synergy. And that's done according to four types of complexity that organisations need to address. So we have organisations to do stuff that is more complex than we can manage on our own, otherwise you just do it on your own, really. So we break organisations down either by doing something different, different tasks, or by different customers, or different geography, or different time. And the order in which those, those different types of complexity are structured makes a massive difference to how the organisation works, and what it's good at, and what it's bad at. So the clearest example I got of this is we did a restructure in a factory, 
and we went from functional structures, so task-based structure to a customer-based structure, and put up productivity by 40% within a week. So we didn't change the kit, we didn't change the physical layout, we didn't retrain them, we just changed the team structure. And the difference in the way the work flowed through and um, their ability to actually get stuff out the door was, was a dramatic shift. So if you think about um, the police in England as opposed to Scotland, at the highest level that's broken down by geography, so we have regional police forces, and then by task, so we have CID, drug squad, whatever, um, neighbourhood policing, and then by geography, again, so you have a beat, um, and then by time, so you have a time, you know, a, a shift on a beat. And in Scotland, they've gone for a different model. So Scotland, everything is, there is no geographic breakdown at the first level, so it's done by task. So there is a national CID, and a national traffic, and a national um, drug squad, and whatever. So you can imagine that would be much better at dealing with stuff that crosses regional boundaries, so um, drugs, organised crime, that sort of thing, and it's pants at doing neighbourhood policing. So we, we were working with a local authority in Scotland, and they said, well, we, ne we don't know who to talk to in the police anymore to do collaborative working. Yeah. So but how you do that structuration has a massive impact on what you have. So then we've got a series of mechanisms to build those parts up into a coherent system. Basically, it's the set of things that you need to do to stop one set of operations screwing things up for another set of operations. So it tends to be things like uh, protocols and schedules and common standards, common languages, that sort of thing. So the example I usually give is the timetable at school, which is the thing that makes sure that all of 1,000 kids and 150 teachers are in the right place at the right time throughout the, throughout the year in a way that ensures that the kids at the end of the year and learn the stuff they need to learn. And if you think about trying to organise that in any other way, it would be, it'd be absolute mayhem, really. And of course, everybody takes those sorts of things for granted when they're there. So you get no glory for doing the school timetable. You just get to sacrifice the whole of your summer holiday. You know, you lose three years off your life. Um, when they're not there, this is a huge driver of inefficiency in organisations. So where that breaks down, um, you get a typical set of symptoms, so conflicts over resources, turf wars, people fighting over the same territory, conflicting messages to customers, so one department will say you can have it next week and another department says we're not starting our bit till next month, so you ain't going to get it then. Um, Weak operations planning, so all the stuff that's in lean about smoothing through operations is here. And the start, start of the systemic breakdown, so where there are spats between operations, you get appeals to the next level of management to try and sort the mess out. Yeah. And you can see how they then get dragged in. So we, I said we see um, faults of commission and faults of omission. This is a massive common fault of omission. So um, we see the same problems again and again and again, and this is Failure of coordination is one of the three most common, I think, that we see. Um, so, one of the problems is that it's, it is deeply, deeply unappreciated in organisations, and we tend not to get promoted for doing this. Um, we tend to promote people for firefighting, and this is rather more about fire prevention. So, it's deeply unsexy and unglorious, um, but a massive, massive impact on the organisational performance. So the circles in this model are, are the operations, and boxes are about management. And so we've got a, let's say this is a division within an organisation with two departments, each with their own departmental management, and this is the management of the division. So the first part of this is about being really precise about the connection between different operations and different areas of performance and who takes decisions about that, which generally speaking people are massively unclear about. 
And part of that relationship is about green performance. So what is it we actually need your departments to do? And how are we going to measure that? And then reciprocally, coming down, what are the resources to do that? So that spinal relationship in any organisation is that trade of resource for performance. So, um, Angela, how much time do you need to do your first presentation? You know, we have that debate about how much time, what's going to be delivered, yeah? And, for example, and so one of the other things that goes wrong with this is fragmentation. We end up having one conversation about performance and another conversation about resource. So I have um, Pauline as the arbiter of performance and Mike as the arbiter of resource. And if they don't talk to one another, um, it's in Pauline's interest to screw me on performance, it's Mike's interest to screw me on resource, and I get sandwiched in the middle. This is the quickest way, I mean actually we're having a conversation about just this outside, we? <laughs> this is the quickest way to break teams, is to break, <coughs> to fragment that conversation. So from a VSM point of view, that needs to be conducted as a, as a conversational lead. It's also the basis of the professional services business model, I think. Is it? <laughs> well, yeah, the big consultancies deliberately uh, separate utilisation from uh, quality evaluation uh, in order to keep, in order to maximise both of the uh, individuals. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful world, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, um, <coughs> Christoph, who's not with, here with us today, um, is an occupational physician. His record is 13 people in the same job broken by this, before anybody noticed. So they, they sort of put someone into role, snap them, get another one, snap them, get another one. Eventually they cottoned on and that's what was going on. So the second thing that goes wrong with this is control the limit. So something happens outside <clears throat> in the environment to change demand. And the operations guys react and management at a more senior level starts to worry that stuff's going on that they don't quite understand. And the classic reaction is to ask for more and more reporting on performance. And then we get a sort of double whammy that the operations guys are now fighting off senior management at the same time as trying to deal with the change situation. Um, so they're not able to do their job properly. And senior managers are no longer concentrating on the stuff they should be, which is the next thing that's coming along. They're now concentrating on trying to micromanage something they didn't understand in the first place. Yeah. This is. I've never been in an organisation where you can't see this happening, and sometimes it's, it's kind of the dominant uh, management regime. And it all goes back to the, the, the way these communications are structured. So the way out of the control of the level is this little understood thing, the monitoring loop, which bypasses a level of management and goes and looks at um, what's actually happening on the ground. So this is a qualitative view to understand <coughs> the reality of what's happening. Um, I was doing some work for Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue, which is the second biggest in the country. And we had the number two guy uh, in the room. And I've never spoken to him about this, but I knew what sort of guy he was. And I just said to him, you still go out and shout, don't you? And he said, yes. So, why? He said, well, I need to understand what it's like on a fire ground, because it's a long time since I was a real fireman. Yeah, I need to understand what my guys are facing. And that's it. So, with good monitoring, you get a qualitative understanding of what's going on. And done well, this builds trust. Done badly, will destroy it faster than anything you can think of. I think this is the, the most skill-dependent part of, of VSM, really. So, the whole structure around actually getting a beast to deliver is really, really quite simple. It's about linking operations to decisions about those operations. So agreeing with measuring performance, agreeing with resources, and monitoring to check it works. Yeah, it's really, really simple. And then we've got chunk of management, which is to, work, to do with looking outside and into the future. So out into the environment, squiggly bit on the um, right-hand side, left-hand side. So this is about surveying 
the market situation, uh, predicting, planning, creating the future R&D, strategic risk. And again, organisations are often vanishingly bad at this. Um, so again, you get classic sets of symptoms when this isn't in place or working. Um, we have the, we've got a mate who's um, a consultant in a big consultancy, 40,000 consultants, and he went along to his boss and said, um, this is a knowledge industry, I think we should be doing some R&D on developing new practice, and the, the, the guy said, yep, I think you're absolutely right, Richard, and you're the man to do it. Um, and 40,000 consultants, they couldn't find the money to pay for one person to do R&D. So that's how out of balance this can get in organisation. I know, it's bizarre, isn't it? Um, it's much cheaper just to go and steal somebody else's, you know. Yeah. So, classic set of symptoms. And the, the one that, I don't know if you can see that, probably just. Um, the one that really gets me, I think, is the strategic risk one. So, S&P 500 top. 500 companies in the biggest economy in the world. So in, this is 2006 <coughs> figures, so pre-crash. 85% have gone out of business since the start. One, only one is still in business of the original S&P 500. Yeah, so that failure rate of organizations, commercial organizations, is kind of endemic. Overwhelming, we tend to focus on internal failure um, but overwhelmingly, the failures are the world changed, they didn't see it coming, and they didn't adapt. So it's almost always externally generated. Yeah. So, um, couldn't resist the photo, the bloke's camping out in the bush, and until his mate takes the photograph with a flash, you can't see this private lions waiting to raid the camp. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they're there, and you've got to be looking the right way. So 35% of fatal strategic risk to organisations came from a direction they hadn't even thought to look in. Yeah. So in VSM, this is all about balance. Um, so good decision making involves balancing the outside and the future with the inside and now. Um, and articulating that balance through the organisation. So the same mechanisms for decision making at every level, team, department, division, whole organisation. So it's, it's, from a model point of view, it's really, really simple. You've got exactly the same rule set at any scale and at any size of organisation. And one of the beauties of it, of course, is that that means if you can design a team, you can design a department, you can design a division, you can design a corporation, you can design a conglomeration of organisations. It's exactly the same design, set of design principles. I'll skip that one. So we're running short on time. So that's VSM. Um, it's about organisations being, in Stafford's words, ultra stable. So able to deal with situations in their environment that could not have been foreseen at the time of their time they conceive. And from a model point of view, a design point of view, a diagnostic point of view, we've got exactly the same rule set replicated through the organisation. So um, for both design and diagnosis, that makes it really, really simple. It scales massively. 